When the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Is there a dress code in heaven? According to this parable, there is. In this parable, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a king who invited all his friends and his political allies to a wedding feast for his son. When it was time for the feast to begin, the king sent his servants to call the invited guests to tell them all was ready, come to the wedding. But the guests would not come. Thinking perhaps that it was a mistake, the king sent other servants. But then the, 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 the scripture says the guests, quote, made light of it and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. And as you might imagine, the king was outraged. And he sent his army to destroy those rude and murderous would-be guests and burn their city. And then, determined to make sure that his son got a proper wedding feast, he sent other servants out to the street corners everywhere to gather in everyone they could find, both bad and good, until the wedding hall was filled. This is called the parable of the wedding feast. And in the context of Matthew's gospel, the feast explains why God turned away from the Jews and gave the promise of salvation to the Gentiles. The parable is an, is an allegory of salvation history. The king is God who prepares a wedding feast for his son, who is Jesus. The wedding feast represents the eternal joy, the eternal joy experienced by all who come into the kingdom and, and, and have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The servants are the Old Testament prophets who were called to summon Israel to the feast the invited guests, the guests who already had the invitation, they, they are the Jews, the people of Israel, who received the original summons, even as far back as Abraham, the call of Abraham. And the people from the streets, good and bad, well, well they're the Gentiles, the ones called much, much, much later. And we see that those Jews who rejected Jesus were themselves rejected, whereas those Gentiles who accepted Jesus gained the kingdom. So the early church got the message. The early church got the message. The same thing can happen to anyone. The kingdom of God is at hand. The table is spread. God desires the banquet hall to be filled. God wants everybody who can squeeze in to be there. Everyone's welcome at the table. But, but, if you're too stubborn or too preoccupied with worldly pursuits to accept Jesus, well, your seat at the table might just be given to somebody else. That's the first part of this parable. That's clear enough. That's the allegory of salvation history. But there's more, and this is where the story gets interesting. Because, surprisingly, we learn that there's also a dress code in the kingdom of heaven. Because we see that as the king mingled with his guests, the way a good host always does, he noticed that there was a man there who was not wearing a proper wedding garment. Now, in Jesus' day, but not only in Jesus' day, even today, if you're going to go to a wedding, 
you're expected to get dressed up a little bit, aren't you? I mean, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be a tuxedo, but at least you should have some clean clothes on. In Jesus' day, that was the custom, and they did it to show respect for the bride and the groom and the importance of what was about to happen. Same today. Now, for the wealthier ones, that meant, you know, fancy clothes, embroidered robes, or gowns adorned with precious jewels. But the point is, even for the poor, even for poor people who didn't have fancy clothes, they, it, a wedding garment simply meant the best clothes they had freshly washed. Anybody could do that. And considering that this was a royal festival, expecting guests to at least have clean clothes was not a lot to ask for. So, <coughs> the guest who was not wearing a wedding garment apparently couldn't be bothered even to go home and change his clothes for the wedding. How rude. How utterly rude that was. That suggests that he was there for the wrong reasons. He wasn't there because he cared about the king or about the son and just wanted to celebrate the son and the wedding feast. He was there to eat. He was there to scarf up as much food and drink as he could possibly get. And the way he dressed could even be interpreted as a sign of disrespect and the king had every reason to throw him out. So that is, let's say, a literal sense of analyzing this, passages, this passage. But now in scripture, there's always, there's a, there's a deeper spiritual meaning to a wedding garment. In the book of Revelation, the wedding garment is a metaphor for righteousness. It's a metaphor for the righteousness of the saints. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, it says, Let us rejoice and exult and give God glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And St. Saint Paul talks about clothing metaphorically as well. Paul talks about putting off the old man, which is our sinful nature, and putting on the new man, which is holiness and righteousness as if he were talking about changing clothes. In Colossians chapter 3, it says, you have put off the old man with his practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion and kindness and lowliness and meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive, and over all of these, put on charity, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So at the spiritual level, the wedding gown represents sanctification and represents holiness. It represents our growth in holiness and charity by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, St. Gregory the Great, in his commentary on this very passage, said, said this. He said, what are we to understand by the image of the wedding garment, if not charity? He who enters the wedding feast without the wedding garment is like one who belongs to the church, having faith, but no love.
the errant guest had refused to put on Christ. He had not valued holiness. He had not chosen to live as a saint instead of a sinner. And so as far as the king was concerned, that was a serious offense. And it deserved being thrown into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, every time we come across that phrase, right, we sort of wince, like, really? But the answer is yes, really. So now the question is this, what does this mean for us today? So I'm going to answer that on two different levels. In the same way that I analyze the passage on two different levels, I'm going to answer the question on two different levels. It has meaning on two different levels. On one level, I'll point out that every Mass, including this one, is both a sacrifice and a wedding feast. It's both a sacrifice and a wedding feast. And in fact, during the Eucharistic prayer, you will see those two images brought together in the final elevation, just before communion, when the priest raises the blessed sacrament and says, behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. That's the sacrifice part. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. That's the feast part. And the church, in its wisdom, fuses those and sees both of those in the Mass. So that is why we show up on Sunday mornings clean and well-dressed, isn't it? That's why we should wear a wedding garment, so to speak, when we come here. Be clean, well-dressed, and show our respect for the King by bowing and behaving because we're all guests at the wedding feast of his son. Think about it. Every time we come in here, we're both at the foot of the cross, we're at the foot of Golgotha, and we're at the wedding feast of the, cross, of the, of the, of the lamb. Extraordinary, extraordinary what we do every Sunday. But then I would say also, I'd analyze it this way, that on a different level, we see that in this parable, God is calling us now more than ever to put on Christ, to put on righteousness, to put on the clothing of charity, and bear witness to his grace and charity to the world around us. God wants us to be clothed with righteous deeds. So we're supposed to look and act differently from the world. So we're supposed to look and act differently in here, and we're supposed to look and act differently out there as well. We're called to live by a higher standard of righteousness than those around us, and when we do, others will see the Spirit of God at work in us and will be encouraged to follow our example. Our behavior is evangelical. People will follow us if they see holiness. There's nothing more attractive than the holiness of the saints. And we're all called to be saints, aren't we? So is there a dress code in heaven? You bet there is. And not just in heaven, but here in this world too. So put on the garment, garments of Christ. Attend mass respectfully and clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. We can do that. Paul says we can do that. We can put it on. You may not feel it, but you don't have to feel it. You can still be patient and kind and merciful. And, and by doing that, you will honor and glorify the king. And that is the lesson of the parable of the wedding feast. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.